agreeing to this talk again. Thank you. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Klaus Hildebrandt <coughs> from TU Delft. Uh, that will be the group of the this year for the Eurographics, which he had uh, organized. Uh, he's an expert on all kinds of things in geometric processing, but in particular uh, vector field and reaction field processing and elastic shift deformations. He's going to tell us a few things about model reduction. Thanks, Jean-Marc, for the introduction, and thanks to Alec and Jean-Marc for organizing the grad school. Very nice program. And uh, so today I'll talk about model reduction techniques for shape deformation. And why do we look at shape deformation? Uh, because actually a lot of applications in geometry processing involve shape deformation. So for example, modeling shapes or animating shapes or objects and also template-based capture of surfaces as well as template-based extraction of shapes out of volumetric data. Also shape optimization, for example, for fabrication. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and also for simulating or controlling dynamics of objects. <coughs> so here's an example of one shape deformation problem, and it's quite challenging. So w it involves nonlinear optimization and also many degrees of freedom. And in addition, uh, in particular in this example, we require real-time responses. So here a modeling framework would not help a lot if it doesn't respond in real time. So there's a demand for efficient algorithms for, for treating these problems. and. Uh, <coughs> but there is some structure that we can profit from. So on the one hand, the, the shapes need to be very high resolved in order to model all the geometric detail. Uh, so in this case of this dragon here, all the scales need to be modeled, so we need quite a number of vertices for these. On the other hand, the deformations that we're interested in can be quite a low dimensional space. So for example, here, the user can just grab some handles and drag them. So all input the user can generate is just quite low dimensional. Uh, so the deformations we actually want to compute here is a quite low dimensional uh, set of deformations. So the intrinsic structure of the problem is quite low dimensional. And today I'll talk about some techniques that we can use to exploit these structures and then build fast approximation algorithms for these type of problems. So the outline for today is that I'll first uh, talk about some background on deformation energies and how we model elastic objects, and then talk about uh, the reduction of linear problems. So here we'll look at vibration modes, and then also an optimization problem that we'll write in this modal basis, which is uh, for controlling dynamics of deformable objects. And then we'll look at the reduction of nonlinear problems, and there I'll introduce some techniques for, mo for reducing nonlinear problems at the example of nonlinear shape interpolation, and then we'll extend this to <coughs> optimizing curves in shape space, uh, and if we have time, we'll also look at the compression uh, of vibration modes. Okay, so, but let's get started with some background on deformation energies. So we're looking at elastic objects. So these are objects that have a rest configuration. And whenever they are deformed away from this rest configuration, then there are forces acting on the object trying to restore the rest configuration. Uh, and in particular, we'll look at a, uh, we'll look at a deformation energy, so that has two shapes as input, two configurations. One is the rest shape, and one is the actual deformed configuration, and the energy gives us the energy, so a positive value, which is the energy stored in this deformation. So let's l start very, very simple, and let's look at a one-dimensional object. Uh, so we'll look at this object here, and then we'll look at uh, a deformation of this object into this one here, and the deformation is given by some map f. 
Uh, and explicitly, let's look at a very simple example where this red uh, point is mapped to the red one, the blue to the blue one, and in between it's linear. Uh, so it's an affine transformation here. And now to, um, <coughs> to define uh, an elastic potential or such a deformation energy, we first describe the strain. So that is how does the object stretch or compress. And then from this description of the strain, we'll add material properties to give us a material response. So how much energy does a strain cost? So let's look at the strain first. Um, so how do we describe the strain in a one-dimensional case? And what we're looking at is how does it infinitesimally change? So we'll look at every point, and then we want to see how does it stretch around this point. And we've uh, seen in the last talk already uh, the concept of manifolds and, and metrics. So this is applied here. So we'll look at a point, uh, P bar, so it's a point on the rest configuration that's mapped to a point F of P bar uh, in the actual configuration. And then we want to know how does the object stretch and in this case, this is looking at the length, how does the length of a tangent vector change? So here we have a vector at this point and we map it also to the deformed configuration and this mapping is done with the derivative of f. Uh, so vectors are mapped with the derivative of f. So yeah, now we're interested in what is the length of the deformed vector and here we're measuring the length, squared length, and then this vector equals the derivative of, uh, of, F of, of V bar here, squared, and that is in the simple case that we have this affine transformation, the derivative is simply multiplication by A, so it's A times uh, this uh, V bar, the starting vector, so the uh, multiple here, we can pull this out of the length, so the vector is stretched by a factor of a, right? So then we call the deviation of this factor or the square of this factor here from one, we call this the strain. So this is how does the metric change. So if it's one, then it's an isometry. If it's larger than one, then we're stretching. If it's smaller than one, then we're compressing. Uh, so, and we can then compute such a value a everywhere in the interval. And in the case of the simple mapping here, uh, <coughs> the strain will be the same everywhere over the object and will always be a squared minus a, okay? So now let's generalize this to, to a solid. So here we're looking at, at a tetrahedron and again we're mapping this to a deformed tetrahedron. So let's, this is the rest configuration. Here we have a deformed configuration and we have a map f from here to there. And again, if we look at a simple affine map, so a map that maps a tetrahedron onto a tetrahedron, and then basically every point, the correspondence here then is by barycentric coordinates, right? So every point that has certain barycentric coordinates here will be mapped to a point with the same barycentric coordinates. So then this is described by an affine map. So here we have now a matrix that is applied to the three-dimensional coordinates of every point plus some vector, right? So good exercise here is to think about what is this explicitly, this matrix, so how do you compute this matrix A? That's a good exercise uh, 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 to get into uh, understanding this mapping actually. <coughs> okay, and then the same, we play the same game. So we look at a point and look at some vector here and we want to know how does the length of any vector change here and that's most efficiently described by looking at the scalar product. So looking at how does the scalar product between two vectors change instead of looking at uh, the, the vectors in all direction. But that's a, it's equivalent. Uh, and so we're looking at a vector, we're mapping this vector and again the, the vector is mapped by the differential so in this case this means it's multiplied by A. So how does the scalar product change? So we're interested in two vectors, V and W here, and we want to relate this to their uh, corresponding vectors here. So we have this scalar product. It's the <coughs> differential applied to the bar vectors in the domain. And then in the simple case, this is just A times 
the vector and a times the other vector and then we can move a over uh, to the other side so we have one linear map here that uh, we need in order to describe how the scalar product between two vectors changes from here to the deformed configuration. Uh, and this uh, vector here is called the Cauchy Green tensor. So that describes this deformation and then the strain is the deviation of this tensor from the identity. Right, so in case this would be the identity, then any scalar product between any pair of vectors here is uh, the same as the scalar product there and if it's not the identity then there is some deviation and uh, this can be then measured uh, with the strain tensor. Right? Um, <coughs> so that's a purely geometric description of, of uh, how the shape deforms and uh <coughs> then we're looking now at how does the material respond uh, to get to get the cost of a deformation, the energy of a deformation, we need to know how the material responds to such a deformation. And there are many different material mo models. And one of the simplest one is the uh, saint fernand kirchhoff model. Uh, and maybe before we look at this, uh, let's maybe go back to the one-dimensional case once again. So the material answer in the one-dimensional case, uh, let me maybe go back to the slide, where the strain is just one number, everywhere on this interval, uh, then the material would, would be some function on this number. So it would take in the strain and then say, okay, so how much energy do does it cost to stretch or compress? Uh, for example, it could be just a linear function, could return just a, or a uh, just, just a strain here, could just be returned, or it could say, well, uh, small deformations don't cost much, but large deformations uh, cost quite a lot, then it would be some polynomial or exponential function even in the strain, for example, right? <coughs> now the St. Fernand Kirchhoff model here uh, is for three-dimensional objects and uh <coughs> here we're looking at the trace of this operator squared and the uh, trace of the square of the operator. So now why do we look at, at, at uh, these uh, quantities, well, if we look at the eigenvalues, so this is a symmetric matrix by construction, yeah, it was A transpose times A, so we can look at the eigenvalues, um, and these two are symmetric polynomials in the eigenvalues, right, and this is done to get isotropy, so it's an isotropic material, so in whatever direction we stretch, it doesn't change. So the energy, whether we stretch in this direction or a stretch in some other direction, this doesn't uh, affect the cost. Yes, it would cost the same energy. So it's an isotropic material and that means it has to be formulated, uh, it can be formulated in symmetric polynomials in the uh, eigenvalues. Well, you don't have so many, right? You can have the constant and you could have the one, uh, the determinant, so the product of the three eigenvalues, right? But there are only these three. And the, the third one is left out in this model uh, because it's, it's higher order, it's, uh, because it's in third order uh, in, in, in the singular values or the eigenvalues, right? So they are not uh, more symmetric polynomials in, in the eigenvalues. Um, and then here we have two constants that are multiplied and these are material uh, constants. So with these we can here change the material uh, answer. So it's a, it's a rather simple model, it has a linear material response. Um, yeah, and also we assume that the, the material is homogeneous so that we have the same uh, and, and a density at every point. So we have the same material parameter and the same way we are evaluating the material at every point. And then to get the overall deformation energy, we're integrating over the whole domain. So at every point, we are setting up the strain tensor 
and then applying, uh, computing the trace squared and this, the trace of the squared operator multiplied with the material uh, parameter, and this gives us the energy for one deformation. Yeah, so it's an isotropic and homogeneous material. Now in the case of tetrahedral meshes, we looked at this so you can evaluate it by going through all tets, so we're summing over all tets, and for every tet we look at what was the affine map, mapping uh, this tet to its corresponding tet here, and then we're uh, uh, calculating the strain, uh, the energy, in uh, first the strain, and then the energy induced by this deformation. It's constant in the tet, so we multiply it with the volume of the tet, and then we're summing over all tets, right? So what it means for every TET, you're computing this affine map, you're building this tensor, you're evaluating the density, you have a value multiplied by the volume, and then you sum it. So one of the learning objectives here would be that you are able to implement this uh, something on Kirchhoff model for a uh, deform deformable TET mesh. Right? And once you have the energy, then you can get the forces as the gradients, negative gradients of this energy, and here you could use automatic differentiation, for example, to compute the gradients or also the Hessian later on. Right? So basically with this you should al already be able to implement this. Now in geometry processing we often look at surface-like structures, and these are in shells, and I'm not going to say many words about these, but uh, uh, in this case, the energy combines stretching, so this is what we looked at, and also bending. So in addition to stretching, we also need a bending component for shell-like structures. Uh, for example, if I, if I take a piece of paper and I would roll it, then uh, this does not cause any stretching, but still, uh, so there's some degree of freedom that also needs to be handled, and this is done by a bending energy. And that uh, then measures not how the metric changes, but how does the curvature change? How does the second fundamental form of the surface change? Okay, so that's the, the introduction to uh, deformation energies. Now let's look at vibration modes. So we're looking at the dynamics of an object, and here we're looking at a discrete object. So we have a <coughs> vector listing all vertex positions, and it's time dependent. And um, this, uh, and here we have the second derivative of this, so that's the acceleration uh, of the object. And we have a mass matrix uh, that associates to every vertex a mass, so it's a diagonal matrix, and at every vertex we have its corresponding mass. So it could be, for example, the Voronoi cell around this vertex, and that multiplied with the density of the material. And then on the right-hand side, we have the forces that are acting. So the equation couples the acceleration of the object with the forces that are acting on the object. And now for vibrations, uh, we only look at the inner forces, so only these uh, forces caused by the elastic object, by the, by the elastic energy. Um, and that would be then the negative or gradient of the energy. Uh, so this is the force that is acting here. Uh, and now for, for the vibration modes, we'll look at small deformations, so we can expand the forces or the gradient here around the rest configuration. Uh, and then we get so that the gradient at some point x is the gradient at the rest configuration plus the Hessian times the displacement plus, a ter plus terms that are uh, of higher order in the displacement. And now the, the gradient at the rest shape is zero. Yeah, the rest shape is the minimum of the energy. There's zero energy, so the, the gradient is zero and we'll ignore, for the vibration modes, we'll ignore the higher order terms. And then the equations of motions are just second order, um, so a second order derivative here. And the force is uh, just simply the Hessian times the displacement. So here I'm switching from, from global coordinates to displacement coordinates. So the U is the displacement of the rest configuration. Uh, so it's X minus X bar. Uh, and then we are simplifying these uh, equations of motion here to a coupled system second order of ordinary differential equations. 
right? And the coupling comes from the Hessian of the elastic energy. So the, the uh, vibration modes are then the solutions of a generalized eigenvalue problem that involves exactly these two matrices, the Hessian and the mass matrix. And here the phi is an eigenmode, so it's a displacement vector. And here we have an eigenvalue, which uh, the square root of this is the eigenfrequency. Uh, so let's maybe look at, uh, ah, let's start with these. Here are three examples. Uh, so we start with a bar as a rest configuration, and here you see the lowest non-trivial mode. So that's the seventh mode. So the first six modes would just be the translation and linearized rotations. So that's six degrees of freedom. And then the first uh, deformation mode, first non-trivial, is this one. And we have a second symmetric one, uh, which is that one. And then it goes into a twisting mode a as the next mode. Now let's look at a bit more complex object, so uh, here we have this camel, and here is uh, a deformation mode of this, and another example, and you can see it quite captures some of the structure of, of natural deformations of the object. Here we have the head of the camel, and it's clamped, and it's sort of some somehow expressive uh, uh, deformations that you get out as the vibration modes here. So as solutions of a generalized eigenvalue problem, the, the vibration modes have some properties. Yeah, for example, they are also normal with respect to a scalar product formed by the mass matrix here. Uh, so here we're looking at this matrix where every column is, uh, is one of the vibration modes. So it's an n by n matrix and uh, every column is a vibration mode, and if we multiply this from left and right with a mass matrix, this is the identity matrix. Yeah? So that means they are uh, mutually also orthogonal and, and they are normalized. And at the same time, the vibration modes also diagonalize the Hessian. Uh, so if, if we do the same construction here with the Hessian, we multiply from left and right, then it's a diagonal matrix. Uh, so a vibration mode, if we apply the Hessian to a vibration mode, the result is uh, m times lambda times uh, phi. And if, if, if you plug this in here and use this property, you immediately see that you end up with a diagonal matrix here. Uh, so this is a diagonal matrix, and on the diagonal we have uh, the eigenvalues. So that's uh, a property that directly is derived from being solutions of a generalized eigenvalue problem. So now let's do the next step and, and write our problem, our dynamics, in these coordinates. Uh, so we're using this matrix, and then if we have some displacement or any displacement, we can represent it by modal coordinates. Uh, so these are coordinates, so if we multiply them with the modal basis, then we get this displacement. Uh, and now we rewrite the equations of motion, so we had them in this formulation in the displacements, and now we plug in this equation here, and uh, we get this equation, so the derivatives here only uh, on, on omega, the ma basis doesn't change over time. Yeah, and then we can multiply the whole equation with this matrix phi from the right, so the transpose of phi, and then we use these identities that we just looked at, and what we get is this equations of motion. So these are the equations of motions in the modal coordinates. And this is a completely decoupled system of equations. Right, so we only have coupling by a diagonal matrix, that means it's completely decoupled. So the vibration in one uh, mode is completely independent of what it does in, in other modes. And in particular, if we want to solve this, we only have to solve one-dimensional problems. Uh, and then we use some, the modal basis to map them uh, uh, to deformations. Yeah, and we can even do this explicitly. Uh, so these uh, one-dimensional equations look like this. And for these, the uh, solutions are well known. Uh, so it's a two-dimension, it's a two second-order, ordinary one-dimensional equation of motion. Uh, equation, uh, differential equation, and uh, it has a two-dimensional solution space in it. Uh, it's a linear equation. 
Uh, and this is given by these two basis functions, yeah, multiplied with some coefficients here. Um, yeah, you can easily check this. If you take sine of square root of uh, lambda times t, second derivative of this is minus uh, lambda sine of t, and then uh, you can immediately see that this satisfies this equation. The same for cosine. So now to, to get a simulation, we, did we specify initial conditions. Yeah, for example, a condition on the position at time zero and on the velocity of time zero. And then we map these into the modal coordinates. And this gives us then values for A and B. Uh, in this case, it's uh, quite simple. So at time uh, zero, uh, sine of uh, lam of square root of lambda times t vanishes and cosine would be 1. So then bi uh, is exactly this value here. And then if we look at the derivative, it's the other way around. This one would be lambda, uh, square root of lambda times uh, 1. So then we immediately get a out of this uh, condition. Uh, so from initial conditions, everything is determined and we can explicitly evaluate the solution at any point in time. Uh, so the, the benefit from going to from the vertex coordinate uh, to the modal coordinates here is that we don't that we can explicitly solve the equation. So we don't need any numerical integration here, right? So it transforming into the space quite simplified uh, the problem. Also, the basis is uh, multi-scale, right? So we have a frequency associated to to every uh, to every mode. And then if we know about the frequency domain that we're interested in, then we can select uh, parts of the basis and maybe discard the others so to even further simplify the problem. Right, so in this sense, this has many analog properties to the Fourier basis that was discussed in the last uh, presentation, but in this case for deformation, uh, for simulation of deformable objects instead of uh, processing of signals. Uh, let me remark that we can also add damping here, and one uh, uh, well-known and often used uh, damping model is the Rayleigh damping model, where we add this term here. Uh, so this is a term that counteracts velocity, right? so it, it will damp uh, uh, the oscillation. And uh, this also in modal coordinates decouples, and then we have this equation, uh, again, it's only one-dimensional equations. Um, the solution space then gets a bit more complicated. You have to distinguish the different cases, whether uh, it's still oscillating or uh, damping is too large and it's not oscillating anymore. So then you get different uh, basis functions, but the principle remains the same. Uh, so in, in, the, in the case that it's still oscillating, we get uh, a vibration at a different frequency. So the frequency is lowered uh, due to the damping. And here we have an exponential function that will damp uh, the sine function, right? Okay, so that's uh, what I wanted to say about vibration modes. So by now you should be able to implement the deformation energy, evaluate gradient and Hessian, and then you can solve the eigenvalue problem, you know the explicit solution, so you can do simulations uh, in modal coordinates. Huh? The, uh, maybe I should mention this, uh, the price to play, pay here, of course, is that we're restricted to small deformations, right? This was, we discarded higher order terms at some point, so that's uh, limited to small deformations. Uh, now let's use these uh, in a bit more complex setting where we look at uh, uh, creating animations uh, by keyframes using uh, physical simulation, and the setup here is that in traditional, uh, computer animation, you would create keyframes, and then you would use splines in order to generate a continuous motion out of these keyframes. And now the idea of this uh, space-time constraints that we'll look at is to uh, combine control of an animation via keyframes with realism provided by physical simulation. Uh, and this has been looked at in computer graphics quite a bit, starting with an early work by Witkin and Kass in 1988. Uh, and since then, it has been studied for characters, fluids, particle system, and also deformable objects. 
Uh, so here we'll look at uh, the formable objects. We have the equations of motions, and now uh, we looked at initial conditions also, and then we could see that if we have initial conditions on position and vol velocity, we could integrate the whole system forward in time. Right, so now if we would specify some keyframes that we want to interpolate, well, this, this would not work. We have to do something, and the idea is to add an additional force. Uh, so that allows us to change the system so that it then interpolates uh, the keyframes. Now, among all possible additional forces that would interpolate the keyframes, we're optimizing to find the force field that minimizes an objective, which is this one, so the squared L2 norm here of the force is minimized. Yeah? So we want, the want to have the least force over the whole animation that is required in order to uh, uh, interpolate the keyframes. So that means, on the one hand, you can say that means uh, that there is a character who is using his forces and he would use them efficiently. Right? Uh, and, and or you can say we're faking the physical system, so we're trying to fake it in the way that it's least visible, so we're distributing the forces we're using over the whole interval. Uh, also, it's, it's a plant motion what comes out right so it knows in advance what will happen and then distributes forces uh, accordingly accordingly uh, and again i think it makes sense to look at a simple case we'll look at the one dimensional case so in this case we have these equations of motion so here's the acceleration we have the damping term uh, here is the the um, eigenvalue is the frequency of the of the oscillation and here we have um, an additional uh, gravitation force that could act and then here we have the ad the additional force and the objective was the square of the additional force so here I can take also the left hand side and then s put this here so it means we're trying to satisfy the equation of motion in the least square sense uh, and this, uh, this, this one-dimensional solution is called the wiggly spline. So that goes back to work by Kass and Anderson, uh, and we later provided the explicit formulae for this. So in case that all the physical values here are zero, so delta and lambda and g is zero, then we get a cubic spline. Uh, so here we have um, interpolation points, uh, prescribed in time, so here's a time axis and here is the value of omega. Uh, so we need to interpolate these and um, <coughs> yeah, if all physical parameters are zero then it's just a cubic spline, but then we can uh, give some values here and then we get an oscillating type of spline. That's why it's called a wiggly spline. Yeah, so here's some oscillation is added, then I also damp it and here a gravitational force is added. Uh. So let's maybe look at this analogy to, to the cubic splines a bit closer. So the cubic splines follow a variational principle, that is the minimization of the second derivative, so the L2 uh, L norm of the second derivative. Um, <coughs> and then you can uh, calculate the Euler-Lagrange equation of this objective, which is that the fourth derivative should vanish. Right? And then in this case, the solutions of uh, functions whose fourth derivative vanishes are exactly the polynomials, so constant t, t squared, and t cubed. So that's cubic splines. Now here we have uh, an analog construction. We have a bit different objective, so it additionally involves these terms. And then we get a bit different equation, but it has the same structure. So it's a fourth order linear equation. Uh, so we can calculate the solution space here, and that's uh, four functions in this case. Um, <coughs> so instead of the monomials up to third order here, we get these, which are damped and driven oscillations. So this is a compact way of writing it. Uh, so here is uh, is maybe easier to understand. So the first two are exactly the one that we've seen uh, before uh, for the simulation. Right. So this should also be part. If 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 we don't enforce any keyframe, it would be a simulation. If no additional force is there, so this should also be solution. And then we have two more solutions, and you see the only thing that happens is that the sign changes. Uh, so we get damped oscillations and we get driven oscillations, and these are excited exactly in the same way as they would naturally be damped. 
And so this also, I think, shows that sort of setting up this objective uh, makes sense because we get this, this uh, solution, which is kind of natural. Uh, so the optimal way to excite, uh, to add forces in, is to e excite them exactly in the way as they would naturally be damped. Okay, and now computation. So for cubic splines, how we do we compute a, a, a cubic spline? Uh, so we, we divide the interval uh, into segments uh, yeah, between the, the, uh, the nodes, the interpolation points. And in each segment, we know that it's a, a, a cubic polynomial. So we have coefficients within uh, each segment. So it's four coefficients in each segment. So in this case, 12 all together. And then we have conditions. So we have interpolation conditions here from the left and from the right. Here also, that's four coefficients. Then we have a second continuity up to the second derivative. So that's two more uh, coefficients here and two more coefficients here. So the first derivative from here should be the same as the first derivative from the other side. Same for the second derivative, two more. And then here also two more coefficients, so four coefficients left. And these we determine by initial conditions here on the position and the derivative. Uh, so that determines 12 coefficients. Uh, it's a linear system of equations. It even has a band structure. So we can solve this uh, quite fast. And the same holds for the weekly splines. Only we don't evaluate the um, polynomials, but we use these uh, damped and driven oscillations. Uh, but it remains the same. You only have to solve uh, a, a band system that depends on the number of keyframes. So quite small system usually. So you can easily solve uh, thousands of them within a second. And the computation is robust yeah, compared to any form of simulation where I would have a numerical integration scheme and then an optimization over time intervals. This is, this is uh, uh, much more efficient, the, uh, having the explicit solution, much more robust also. Right? You don't have any bound on the, on the frequency right? coming from a discretization, for example. So here's an example <coughs> uh, where now we are modifying the, the eigenvalue, the lambda here, spring constant, and then you can see it gets oscillating, but still interpolates. Right? And then you can add damping, you can add this gravitational force, yeah, or you can change the boundary conditions. And you can see you get this sort of spline uh, uh, that describes oscillations. Now back to uh, uh, higher dimensional case, so a deformable object. We've seen we have this equation of motion uh, for the displacement vectors. And then we can write the equation as we've seen in, in the modal basis. And the neat thing here is that the objective also decouples in the modal basis. Right? So if you write the space-time constraint objective in the modal basis, it also decouples. So in this case, the objective is simply a sum over one-dimensional uh, 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 energies, right? and each corresponds to one modal coordinate. Uh, so that means that the solution for an elastic object is a, a wiggly spline in every modal coordinate. Right? So we can represent the solution as <coughs> a wiggly spline times the modal basis. So we uh, on all we have to do is to determine then weekly splines coefficients uh, uh, for every modal coordinate. Uh, and then we may even uh, reduce and not use all coordinates. Usually we only need the lowest uh, uh, frequencies here. <coughs> so let's look at one example. So we want to model a motion of this cactus that jumps, and I, I cannot model uh, very well, so I just take four times a copy. And, and associate some point in time. Uh, so it should assume these keyframes at, every po uh, at these four points in time. And then I additionally fix the base in the first segment and in the last segments and add an upward velocity here and a downwards velocity at this point in time. Right? And here's what comes out. <coughs> so it's a planned motion. Uh, you can see that it prepares to jump. Uh, crouches and then, then uh, jumps. And when it uh, lands, you can also see that it absorbs the, the impact 
uh, of the landing. Yeah, and what we need to do here is, here in this segment, we have a number of uh, weekly coefficients. Here we have a number of weekly coefficients, and here as well, and they are all determined exactly by uh, these <coughs> constraints that I'm imposing here. Uh, now we can now we can go even one step further and see that that we can profit from from this uh, physical model here in the background, and we don't even need to provide a full keyframe. So it's quite difficult to model a natural pose in which such a cactus would jump. Uh, why is it that pose that we had? So it's much easier by just providing some parts of the of the object as a constraint. So in this case, we're looking, we're just specifying this uh, natural, this, these boundary conditions to be these shapes and zero velocity. And then we say in the middle, the top should be lifted. And then from these uh, conditions, you get such a motion. Yeah, so here we have uh, one have to determine weekly spline coefficients for this interval, for that interval. We're using a 30-dimensional space here. Uh, if we re uh, remove all the conditions here, we're optimizing a least squares problem here in 30 dimensions. Right? Um, so in, in this case, if we provide a partial keyframe, then it's not decoupled in the modal coordinates anymore. So satisfying this constraint will couple the uh, weekly splines, the, the different uh, modal coordinates, so that's why in this case then we need to solve a system for all them. We cannot solve it uh, for every uh, coordinate individual, but we still have to only specify weekly spline coefficients. So, and it's a quadratic objective here. Yeah, and then you can play around with this, you can tilt this, and you can see that you already get quite some complex motions. So that, that that starts to wiggle in order to have the impact to, to, to uh, meet this constraint here at some point in time. <coughs> it's an elastic energy in the background here, right? So, the, so we, we start with the elastic energy, then we set up these equations of motion, which involves the Hessian of the elastic energy, and then uh, we transforms this into modal coordinates, and then we compute wiggly splines. But the coefficients of the wiggly splines, right, these are from the elastic model, right? These come from the eigenvalues of the Hessian. Right? From the, you get the eigenvalues from the Hessian, from this you get uh, the different coefficients in the wiggly spline. Right? So, it's not, so that's, that's why it, uh, uh, it behaves like an elastic object, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. So we only so as degrees of freedom are only these. So when you compute your system, you only add these degrees of freedom here, yeah. And then you can compute the the Hessian with respect to these degrees of freedom only, and and get modes that are own that will preserve this <coughs> this constraint. Right, yeah. Very good point. Okay, so but the limitation here still is that we're limited to, to small deformations and we want to uh, push this a bit further but still keeps this very nice structure that we can get explicit uh, uh, solutions. So we're not going for the nonlinear case here, yeah, which, which is, uh, has to be handled very differently and, and, and is a very difficult problem, but we're using something in between linear and nonlinear, so we're using some non-linearity in order to compensate for linearization artifacts, and there are different techniques for this in graphics, and here we're using what is called rotation strain warping. So basically takes the anisotropic, uh, the, uh, the anti-symmetric part of uh, the deformation gradient, so of this mapping A of the tetrahedron that we had in the beginning, and maps this to a rotation. Uh, this, way, uh, um <coughs> this way artifacts are are uh, reduced. Uh, and then we can formulate uh, the problem, but formulate the constraints on the warp motion. So we have a linear motion, then we apply this warping map in order to reduce the artifacts, and then we are specifying the interpolation constraints, the keyframes for the warp motion. <coughs> yeah, so this makes the problem a nonlinear optimization problem. but it remains very low dimensional. 
Uh, because we still have this space of weekly sprints that describes motions. We still only optimize over very low dimensional spaces, so 30 dimensional spaces or 50 dimensional spaces. And uh, that's why we can compute uh, uh, solutions here. And then here's one example <coughs> where now we're twisting this top of the object, uh, and then you can see. <coughs> that we can get motion that has this twist. So this you can't do with, with a linear elasticity model. <coughs> so let's look at some more complex results. <coughs> and so here we are, we are looking at this X and we're specifying as interpolation constraints that the hands should bump into the ground at some point in time and then later the feet should bump into the ground uh, at some later point with a certain velocity, and then it should stand straight. So that's going to be a handspring, and here you can see the result. Now you can see this plant motion, and you can see how it uh, absorbs the effect of landing and then also crouches and pushes back the style. And here you can see, so it's, it's in a 30-dimensional modal space that is then warped, and uh, so all altogether, 60 weekly splines need to be computed. Yeah? And that's for the whole motion. Sorry. Yeah. I missed. Oh, I missed something in the in in a step somewhere. Like, how can you get massive? deformations using yeah, yeah. So a lot of a right, So let me go back to this. So we have this nice linear model, and uh, for this we can explicitly compute the solutions very quickly, right? And now I said if we would go to a completely nonlinear model, start from scratch with a nonlinear model, we ne need to discretize in time and and solve much more complex optimization problems. So what we're actually doing here is something in between. We're removing linearization artifacts out of the deformation. And this is done by a process called rotation strain warping, and I didn't explain this okay. in any detail. Uh, okay, so the idea, as I said, is you take the, the anti-symmetric part of the deformation gradients and move those to rotations. Uh, yeah, but I don't want to go into details here. So it, it and then the, the uh, so then the constraints are formulated for these warped deformations. Uh, so that adds a nonlinearity into the objective, but we still have the structure that we can uh, get a space of motions of weekly uh, described by weekly splines uh, over which we only optimize. So it's a rich space of motions that fits to this pro uh, to this problem and allows us to yeah, to only get reasonable motions in just a very low dimensional space. This warping here. Like in the, in the linear yeah, case, yeah. You, never need to you never need to touch anything on the order of like the number of tets. Is yeah, that also true yeah. here? No, no. Y here for for this warp map uh, to reconstruct it, you uh, you need to evaluate all of them. So you need to solve, I think, a linear system in the tets. Um, yeah, you could try now to, to simplify this, to approximate it, uh, uh, but we haven't done anything in this direction. Yeah. yeah, so also the computation times here then then goes, uh, yeah, so from fractions of, of, of a second goes up to, to uh, 10 seconds to computing this motion. Yeah, five to set up, four to set up the system here and five to solve the optimization problem. Yeah. So it's only 60 dimensional, so here you can see how stiff and difficult these type of optimization problems are. And uh, yeah, so the fully nonlinear is not solvable for deformable objects uh, at this point. At least we don't have any solution. Um, here's a different example of a jump. So here we are starting uh, again with a rest configuration, and then we want the feed here, and we want an average velocity pointing upwards here. Uh, and then later we want the feed again to bump into the ground. Here we're specifying a, posi uh, a position for the center of mass also. Uh, and then you get this motion uh, where you can see that it uh, takes his arms to, to prepare the motion and, it, and, and, and gets quite some 
uh, interesting motions that you get out here. Now, one more example of uh, done in a similar manner, where the uh, cactus has now several jumps uh, to take. In in all of this, the optimization that was done over the additional forces was done assuming that the forces could be uh, distributed anywhere within the volume of the deformable object, right? Yeah. So yep, is yep. there a uh, version of this where the forces are constrained to be only on the boundary or uh, something like that? Yeah, okay, that's a very good point. So we're assuming basically that this object can generate arbitrary forces, right, in, in, in any way. And that's a good question. Uh, so we looked at this a little bit, but there's no working uh, solution for this, where you would restrict this to uh, some specific motion. So interesting would also be articulation, for example, that you allow it only to, to act articulated. Uh, then there are other approaches, of course, for skeletons. Uh, uh, um, but here we, we did not uh, have any system yet to restrict a very good question. So that would be an open challenge here to, to find a good way that you can efficiently r limit the, the, the way uh, forces are generated. Uh, thanks, very good question. Um, okay, so that was uh, ends as part on, on linear deformation models and a bit of, of nonlinearity here at the end. But now let's look at real nonlinear uh, deformable objects. And I'll explain some techniques how we do model reduction in this case at the example of the shape interpolation problem. Now, shape interpolation, what is this? And this is uh, uh, best explained by, by looking at one example. Uh, so here we have six example shapes, and we want to be able to construct the in-between shapes. Uh, so here we have a very simple uh, user interface that specifies a weight, positive weight for each of the shapes. So the closer this red dot is to one shape, the higher the weight for the shape is. And here we see the corresponding interpolated shape. Uh, so this is a problem, shape interpolation, that comes up in, 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 in different applications in graphics. For example, when we transfer motion or when we're processing motions. And, of course, also example-based methods. For example, for controlling material behavior or inverse kinematics or for editing with example shapes. Uh, in such case, a shape interpolation is important. Um, now, the model for shape interpolation we're using here uh, uses elasti elasticity. And the idea is, so in the, uh, is that, that we're associating to e each example shape an elastic potential. Uh, so we have three example shapes, so we associate to each of them a deformation energy, and that deformation energy has this example shape as its rest configuration. Uh, so we have for shape X1, we have uh, an elastic potential with X1 as its rest configuration. And then we're defining a positive weight for each of the shapes, and uh, we're minimizing the weighted sum of these uh, elastic potentials. Right, so that's, uh, that's a nice formulation of shape interpolation. It has some nice properties. For example, one is the Lagrangian uh, property. So if only one of the weights is non-zero, for example, for x1, then the interpolating shape would be x1. Right? Then this is the only uh, uh, potential that pulls at the interpolating shape, so it will be exactly the rest configuration. Uh, and then also we can always uh, normalize the weights to one, uh, because if we multiply this objective by some scalar, uh, that would not change the minimizer. And then it's uh, also rotation invariance, rigid motion invariant. Uh, if, if we rotate or translate any of the example shapes, it will not change the, the average shape. Uh, and also the average shape is only determined up to rigid motion. Uh, so this comes directly from properties of the elastic potential. Okay, so the, the, the problem here then is because it's a nonlinear energies that we're working with. This is a nonlinear problem, non convex optimization problem, typically high dimensional. The example shapes may have a million 
degrees of freedom. Uh, and now we want to approximate these interpolated shapes very fast. And the way that we're uh, uh, trying to get this is uh, a model reduction approach. So we're spending some effort in a pre-computation to compute a low dimensional problem that already approximates uh, the high dimensional problem and is fast to solve, right? Uh, and uh, actually this construction splits into steps and one is that we set up a, a reduced order model, so a lower dimensional system, and then we need a scheme to fast evaluate gradients and the objective for the optimization. So let's look at uh, uh, both of these steps and start with the reduced order model. Um, so why can we hope that we can approximate this with a, a low dimensional system? So yeah, we're, we're having shapes that have a lot of, so have many degrees of freedom. And uh, actually we're only interested in some low dimensional manifold of interpolated shapes. So we're not interested in arbitrary configurations of these shapes, but only in the small set of uh, uh, interpolated shapes. Huh? So in this two dimensional space here, we want to specify weights and get these shapes. The others we are not interested in uh, at all. So there's a lot of redundancy. Uh, so the idea then is to, to set up uh, an affine space, so a linear space here, uh, because that's uh, uh, convenient for the optimization. And we want to set it up in a way that for every minimizer, we all have a point in this uh, low dimensional space which is already close uh, to this minimizer. Right? So we are setting up a, spa a linear space that's a bit more higher dimensional than, than the number of uh, interpolated shapes, but should be able to approximate these already. Uh, and there are different approaches of how you can construct such spaces and they differ in the computational efforts that you spend in constructing the space. And on the other side, the benefit is, is some more control over the approximation error. So one, one approach would be to sample the solution space. So we're sampling the parameter space and calculate the minimizers. Uh, so then we have a sampling of, of our interpolation manifold here. And then, then in the next step, we'll construct the uh, linear space that best approximates these samples. Right? So, and this can be done by proper orthogonal decomposition or uh, principal component analysis. So we can, can compute the affine space that has foot point and a matrix uh, describing the basis, so a basis matrix here. And then we can project every point into the space and we're minimizing, so we're finding the basis vectors and the foot points such that the difference, uh, squared distance of every sample and its projection is minimized. Uh, the sum over all the differences to the project is, is minimized. And this you can solve by one, uh, uh, by solving one eigenvalue problem uh, that involves a matrix of size number of samples. Uh, so here, uh, uh, we have a matrix listing as columns all the samples. Here's the mass matrix and we're forming this matrix. We have to cal calculate the eigenvalues, uh, the eigenvectors of this, and then we can lift these to basis vectors here. So this uh, second process of constructing the uh, best approximating subspace, we can control well. Uh, then, but in addition, there's an error due to sampling. How good is the sampling of, of the solution space? One more remark uh, is that actually I'm simplifying here a little bit because uh, all the minimizers are only determined up to rigid motion, right? So it's not a two-dimensional manifold here, but it's a six-dimension, six plus two-dimensional manifold, but we're not interested in, in being able to approximate all the rotated versions of a minimizers, but only one instance of it. So what we're doing uh, uh, is that we're registering, rigidly registering, all shapes against one uh, a reference shape, for example, the mean shape. Uh, when I construct the subspace? Yeah. No. No, 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 I don't, I don't. The number of samples is way higher than the dimension of the, of the space that we're constructing. So the space will not interpolate all the samples. Yeah, 
Yeah, so this will be in the space. The space will be formed that, that it contains the example space, uh, example shapes. Yeah. Yeah, so this, okay, uh, this is an addition, in addition to, yeah, this we would always add that we be able to, uh, that we be able to um, represent all the examples. Yeah, it's a very good point. Yeah, it's not, not really in, in the formulation, but we'll always add those. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and this is a quite powerful approach that gives quite some control, and you can find nice spaces to uh, approximate even complex uh, deformations like this twisting uh, of the cylinder here. So this is uh, an interpolation in a 20-dimensional subspace computed via this sampling strategy. The downside... You should define whether uh, the cylinder or, uh, or the one on the left is the rest configuration. Yeah, a very good point. Do you get the same uh, whether... Let, 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 me, let me answer this question. So this is, uh, so in this case, we're working then with two elastic potentials. So what we're doing is we have one elastic potential for this shape and we have a second elastic potential for the other shape. So we have one <laughs> potential that has as a rest shape the straight cylinder and one that has a curled cylinder as its rest shape. <coughs> and then we're, we're a averaging these. Yeah? So we provide the weight for the left one and a provi uh, provide a weight for the right one. And then we're computing the minimizer. And so, it's in the so there is no choice of a rest configuration. Right? We have a rest configuration for every example shape. So a potential with a rest configuration for every example shape. And so in this sense, this is not a simulation anymore, but we're using elasticity in order to model a problem, a more geometric uh, uh, problem. Yeah, right? So there, there are two elastic potentials involved, and we get this. So we have these two elastic potentials, and this one would be the minimizer for summing the potential that has this rest shape and that shape, and we get a weight of 1 for this and 0 for that. And then we go, we give a weight of 0 0.9 to this one and a weight of 0 0.1 to that one. Then we get this shape as a minimizer. And then we have a weight of 0 0.2 to the one and to the potential that has this rest shape and uh, 0 0.8 for this rest shape and uh, uh, 0 0.2 for the potential that has this rest shape. And then if we minimize the sum of the two, we get this one okay. as its minimizer. But so then in the previous image where you had the zero potential for one of the three, uh, uh, sh yes, this one. So in this, this one was just to show how you define one of the three potentials then. Yeah. So yeah, so here we have uh, the three example shapes. Uh, each of them has a potential. And here it would be for some set of weights, we get this minimizer. This is okay. what this image shows. Right. The color is, uh, is the stresses uh, induced by this deformation here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, drawn on the rest shape. So, so for each of them, there is uh, force. And you can see these forces are also in balance, right? Uh, right yeah, so this is. Not very important here, only sort of we're doing the step from geometry to actually a physical, that's why, why we're adding this color in here. Okay. Uh, so the, the downside of the sampling approach is that you actually have to compute a number of samples, right? You have to solve this optimization problem several times and that can take some time. So we are in so for certain applications, we are interested in a fast pre-computation, and then there are methods where you don't have to compute samples. And one thing you can do here for the shape optimization problem is to look at differentials, right? So, and that's, that's also the general principle. If you don't want a sample, you can look at differentials of, of your objective or your system yeah, uh, uh, to, to get some more information on how to construct spaces. So in this case, we can look how does is if the interpolated shape vary in first order when we change the weights for the example poses. Uh, and in this case, uh, then we get something like a tangent space to this uh, manifold, right? So we can compute if we increase one of the weights for one of the example shapes, how does in first order the interpolated shape change? Uh, and uh, this we can also do at one of the example shapes, and then we have this simple formula here. 
So it involves the Hessian and the gradients of two different potentials. So uh, this should be the derivative of the average shape at this point when we increase the weight for this example shape. Right? And that involves then the Hessian uh, of the potential that has this rest configuration and the gradient of the potential that has this, uh, that has this rest configuration. So it looks like a Newton method, but it's actually mixing the, the um, uh, different potentials here. Yeah, so and if we do this for all uh, the example shapes, we get sort of a tangent space here, and then we can do this for the other example shapes, shapes as well, so we get a number of, of, of displacement vectors. And then we build an affine space that contains, so the smallest, look at the smallest affine space that contains the example shapes as well as all these uh, tangent spaces. Right, so that's one affine space in space of all configurations. It's a low dimensional space and we can restrict the optimization to this space. Uh, so it gives a bit less uh, uh, of, of a guarantee for approximation, but it's much faster to compute. So in this case, you only have to uh, set up the Hessians of the example shapes, factorize them and then solve a number of um, linear systems. So that's much faster than computing a number of samples. Okay, so these are two, two ways of constructing such a low dimensional space. So then we can restrict the optimization problem to the space. We already have a low dimensional system, but one more step is required. And the problem is that we want to optimize in the space. So we need to be able to evaluate the gradient and, and uh, the objective itself. Uh, and one way to go would be to take the reduced coordinates. So these are the coordinates in the low dimensional space, and then to reconstruct the corresponding shape. Uh, compute the force and project it back into the low dimensional space. Uh, so the problem is then, then sort of we're working in this low dimensional space, but force evaluation would require to uh, uh, query the whole high resolved mesh. That's, that's what we want to avoid. And the question is, is there a shortcut? Uh, can we avoid reconstructing the, the uh, whole mesh? And there's one nice example that shows indeed this is possible, even with exact evaluation for the Sunfern on Kirchhoff material. Uh, so in that case, the, the energy is actually a quartic polynomial in the displacements. So what you can do then is uh, if you have a subspace and you only want to evaluate the forces and the energy and the Hessian in the subspace and the restriction of these to the subspaces, so that's exactly our shortcut, we can just pre-compute all polynomial coefficients. Uh, so it's a force order polynomial in the reduced space. Uh, and then we can exactly evaluate all these quantities uh, at time depending only on the dimension of the reduced space. So that is an exact evaluation that is independent from the resolution of the input mesh. Uh, the drawback here is that the evaluation and storage required evaluation time and storage requirement scales in force order in the subspace dimension. So that becomes infeasible for larger spaces. You can do it like up to 50 dimensional spaces, but then becomes maybe even more costly than, than, than uh, co reconstructing the full mesh. Uh, so for more general materials and um, for Oops, I wanted to have another one first. Uh, for more general uh, materials and uh, um, faster evaluation, uh, we, can, we can rely on approximation. And one way to approximate the, the forces in a reduced space is to use this optimized curvature. And the idea is that we, we've seen that the forces are actually uh, assembled by going through all the tests and computing a local force. And that also holds for the projected forces. So the projected forces is a sum of uh, components from every TED. So we have a low dimensional vector, the projected force, and it's a sum of a very large sum of components from every TED. So the idea then is uh, to use sort of a curvature here, that is to not evaluate all TEDs, but only some, uh, a small set of TEDs and weight them with some factor. And now the choice of what tests to evaluate and how to weight them is determined in, in an optimization where we generate a training set by evaluating the force in the subspace. So some random subspace coordinates, we're evaluating the forces here. And this way we, get a, we, we generate a force training set 
And then we're minimizing the quadratic training error. Uh, subject, yeah, so we're finding a weight such, such that these uh, approximate forces and best approximate the training set. And we have constraints that the weight should be positive and that this weight vector should be sparse. Right, so we only want to select a low number, set, let's say 1,000. So it's a, 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 a constraint on the number of non-zero entries in this vector. So it's like a, an L0 minimization here. And such problems can be solved, for example, uh, in this case with non-negative hard thresholding pursuit uh, methods. So in this way, you get a selection of tests uh, and weights for them, and then you use these to approximate forces or also energy. Ah, let me go back now here. There's one more other alternative that we've been using, and here's the idea is to use mesh coarsening. So the, the, the subspace is given by one, it's an affine space, right? One point and a vector space attached to this point, and the point is one shape one configuration, so it could be this shape here. And then every vector you can see as a displacement, so it's a vector field, a vector for every vertex. It's a vector field on the shape. Right, so this way we can encode the, 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 the subspace as a shape plus uh, vector fields. A set of vector fields are for every basis vector, one ve vector field on the shape. And then the idea is to coarsen the mesh and the vector fields, and this way we get a second subspace for this coarse mesh. Uh, and we have an identification of the points, yeah, just the same coordinates, uh, a, a shape here, and then we would map it to the same coordinates here, so we can map between these two spaces, they are isomorphic. And then the idea is, instead of evaluating, so instead of constructing this function, we just simply unconstruct that one. Uh, so instead of lifting to the high resolved mesh, we lift to a coarse mesh, calculate the forces here, and then uh, uh, we get reduced coordinates uh, for this one, and we use this in the optimization. Right? So this way, uh, uh, we can also get something that doesn't depend on the high resolution, but only then on the resolution that we use here for the approximation. Okay, so this is another alternative. So we've seen uh, three different shapes for force approximation, and if we combine then this uh, reduce order model and the force, force approximation, then we get a system, low dimensional system, and we can fast evaluate the objective and the gradient um, so that we can solve this independent of the resolution uh, of, of the mesh. And actually, um, for this uh, shape interpolation problem, we are using then a, a BFGS scheme, so quasi-Newton method to solve these optimization problems. Um, yeah, so we're using a warm start for the Hessian here, so the BFGS scheme uh, takes an approximate Hessian to start with, and this we feed here with the Hessian of the average shape that we compute once, and then we use this BFGS formula to update the Hessian, uh, and with this construction, you can compute interpolated shapes at 20 to 1,000 uh, shapes per second, depending uh, uh, on, on the dimension of the space and the way you approximate the forces. Yeah, okay. Let me skip that. And here are some examples. So here we have five shapes. Uh, each of them has 300,000 uh, triangles. We want to interpolate between them. Uh, and here we can see that we can actually compute uh, 30 shapes per second in, in this case. And it includes larger deformations, for example, from here to there, where you really need a nonlinear uh, deformation energy to be able to accurately model this. Uh, here's a second example where we have even higher resolved shapes, but we have less deformation, right? The deformations are smaller. And then you can see that here uh, uh, we even get higher uh, frame rates. So we can compute more than 50 shapes per second uh, in this example. So the, the computation does not depend on the mesh resolution, but rather on how large are the deformations between the object, because then we need to uh, choose a, a subspace accordingly. Uh, last example has some um, 
articulated shapes and uh, I found it uh, remarkable how well this articulation is uh, actually preserved during the interpolation, right? This uh, is still all materials we use here are isotropic and homogeneous, so it's not in the elasticity model, only from the example shapes already, oops, only from the example shapes uh, we already get this uh, articulation into the interpolated shapes, so it's, it's preserved. <coughs> Now, um, this type of techniques that we use uh, can be used in a much broader context for different problems that have been used, and let me give you some examples. So here we've seen, <coughs> we see uh, a video that we've had before, and here it's uh, a uh, deformation editing, so we are minimizing elastic energy with some constraints that come from these handles here, and this is actually computed in a 40-dimensional space uh, that is computed from the sampling. Uh, so you can see that even deformations uh, uh, like these ones are already well approximated, in this case in a 40-dimensional space. Yeah, some other work here also of uh, Alec uh, would construct spaces out of skinning constructions, so then you can get articulation all to also into the deformations, right? Because you're restricting the subspace uh, uh, to deformations uh, that, that include this articulation. Uh, and you can be very fast here. Uh, another example is this one. Ah, uh, where we construct subspaces in a way that they will preserve symmetries. So we have an object and a description of symmetries of the object, and then we're constructing subspaces in a way um, that they will, that all deformations will preserve symmetries. So whatever modeling operation you apply here uh, will always preserve the symmetries uh, of this object. So that makes modeling of such naturally uh, symmetric objects more efficient. Ah, okay. Uh, and also, besides modeling, there are applications in simulation, and uh, here we have a real-time system, so a hyper-reduced system for projective dynamics, um, and that allows you to, to run a simulation of elastic uh, materials uh, in real time, and the benefit is then that a user can interact with such a simulation. And here, New techniques have been developed to adjust these, uh, this approach to uh, hyper-reduce, uh, to projective dynamics. So this paper will be presented at SIGGRAPH this year. Okay, so this is about basic uh, um, methods for model reduction of nonlinear problems. So let's go back to the shape interpolation problem and take it one step further and look at a bit more complex problem. That is, we're looking at curves in shape space. So we're not looking at a simple, uh, a single shape, but we're looking at a sequence of shapes. So it's a sequence of vertex positions of one shape, of one mesh, and that's an, an animation or a, a motion of a deformable object. And now we want to use this shape averaging for processing of such motion. And uh, what can we do if, if we only have an averaging operation and want to uh, uh, process a curve? And uh, if we go back to, to, to a planar curve, a polygon and plane, what we can do is smoothing the curve by iterated averaging or Laplace smoothing. So what the idea is to compute uh, for every shape, uh, for every point here, the average of its neighbors, and then to move the point towards the average of its neighbors. And, and that we do to every point in order to smooth this. And then we iterate, and this, perform, uh, this uh, generates smoother and smoother curves. And now we can do the same thing uh, for, for a curve in shape space. So in that case, every point is the vertex coordinates of a mesh. Yeah? So it's one configuration of the mesh. Uh, and then we want to average it. And then we compute again the, the um, 
average and move it towards the average of the neighbors. But we're not computing the average of the vertex positions, but we're using this uh, shape averaging, this elastic um, shape interpolation here. So this can be written, moving towards the average of the neighbors can be written as one averaging involving uh, the shape and its neighbors. And then we're applying here this non-linear averaging. So we iteratively smooth a curve in shape space by averaging, uh, uh, yeah, by moving it towards the position, the configuration of its neighbors. And here's an example. So here we have a curve, and this curve is continuous, but has a jump in the derivative. So it bends up, and here's a jump in the derivative, and then it bends down into a different direction. So after some smoothing, this discontinuity is uh, removed. And here's a bit more um, complex example. Yeah, but it's uh, created by the same principle. So we have pieces of, of curves that are spliced together continuously, but there are jumps in the derivative. <coughs> uh, here are the individual segments. And after smoothing, you cannot find the transitions anymore. You cannot see where the, the uh, tangent jumped before. <coughs> Oops. And um, well, then you can apply all these techniques that you know from planar uh, curve smoothing. Yeah, for example, the, this iterated averaging would quickly oversmooth a curve, so we can apply a restoring force. So some force that pulls the solution, the actual curve, back to the initial curve in order to avoid oversmoothing. Uh, so that just means we add an additional uh, uh, variable here that controls how much, how strong is the force pulling back, and then we add this into the averaging operation. And here's one example. So we have this uh, motion of a hand. We have some artifacts that we want to uh, remove. So we're smoothing the curve, and then the artifact is removed, but uh, also the motion has changed. So the finger and thumb would touch in the original motion, but they don't after smoothing. <coughs> yeah, and then you can add such a restoring force, and by this you can improve this, uh, so have less over-smoothing. Here's one um, application. So here we have data generated by motion capture, and it's generated frame by frame by a nonlinear optimization, so we have some jittering artifacts in the temporal domain. Uh, here you can see some of these jittering artifacts, and then you can apply the smoothing in order to remove such artifacts. So what is the benefit of this method over uh, alternative approaches. For example, if you fit a spline into uh, every vertex coordinate to smooth it. And now if you, if you do this spline fitting, then you can see you introduce artifacts. Uh, for example, the head shrinks, yeah, because it has no information about, about this being an elastic object. <coughs> and um, yeah, so this would not happen with this flow. Because what, what, this what this smoothing operation does, it, all it reduces the energy between consecutive frames. So it would on only remove deformation energy. So that way it cannot create a new artifact because it would requ require additional, uh, inf uh, additional energy. Uh, so in this sense, it's, it's, it's a, 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 a filter that, that sort of sees the structure of the object here and preserves that. <coughs> Now we can ask uh, uh, what are the limits of this flow. So we're, we're starting with a polygonal where we can smooth it and smooth it and smooth it. So what happens? And from the planar iterated averaging, we know it would contract a curve into a point. Yeah, and we can see the same happening here. So we're starting here with some polygon. After some smoothing, there's less motion. And at some point, it contracts to a point, a ah, point in shape space. So that means into one shape. Uh, another thing you can do is to keep the boundaries fixed of a curve, and then uh, you can smooth and smooth and see what is the limit. And here's an example of the, uh, uh, yeah, this is the example we started with, and we're keeping the boundary configurations fixed, and we're getting this uh, curve, and it actually 
turns out that this uh, <coughs> is actually a ge geodesic. So in the case of a planar curve, this would converge to a straight line, and in this case, it converges to a geodesic in shape space, following exactly the definition of uh, Heeren et al. Uh, so that involves Martin Rumpf, Benedikt Wirth, and, and Max Wedetsky. So in this sense, this uh, smoothing operation is actually a curve shortening flow in shape space. So that means we have also an algorithm uh, to compute geodesics in shape space. And since we only apply local, <coughs> local computations and we can use the reduction that we've seen in for the uh, shape averaging, we can actually compute uh, much higher resolved geodesics, in particular in the temporal domain. So here we can see a geodesic with 250 uh, uh, shapes, and we uh, can uh, compute the geodesic here. Uh, so if you want to solve this brute force, this would, be, uh, would have more than 30 million degrees of freedom. So we can compute, so we're trading off basically some spatial accuracy uh, by the model reduction for much higher uh, resolution in the time domain. So this is, in this sense, an efficient way of uh, computing geodesics in shape space. And once you can, can compute such uh, geodesics, so shortest curves in, in, in the shape space, you can do much more, uh, you have a much stronger structure and you can do much more curve um, processing operations. So for example, you can do subdivision. So here's an example of corner cutting. Uh, so we have four points, and corner cutting means uh, we're adding points here at one third and two thirds uh, between the segment, and then we're cutting the kernels. So we get a new smoother uh, uh, polygon, and then we iteratively do this to get a smooth motion, and here we can see the same in shape space. So we're uh, starting with these shapes, and then we're cutting the corners, computing the geodesics, and, and, and so on. And this way we can generate such a smooth uh, motion, so that's the subdivision curve resulting from these four shapes here. <coughs> Why do you cut at one third and two third, and not, for example, one quarter and three quarters? Uh, so that's the this is the corner cutting scheme, right? You can you can vary this. You can cut at at uh, uh, at, at other fractions, and then then you get a bit different scheme. So this corner cutting is uh, is the, the Cutting is designed in a way that you get uh, splines, second-order splines, as, as the um, limit. Uh, if, if you change this, uh, the way you cut, you probably get other uh, uh, limit curves. So this is, you have the freedom to design this in the way you want. This is just one example. But this uh, corner cutting is sort of a stand standard scheme that we use here. Yeah, but this is a degree of freedom. You can cut uh, in whatever way you want here. Uh, so here for these schemes, for all of them, I'm just showing that you can do things in some way, right? Also the smoothing, you can do much more optimization, trying to, to, to preserve whatever, the length of the curve, or these kind of things. Uh, this is just basic schemes. Uh, that uh, actually, I think here. that if we want to get the spline as a limit, it should be one quarter and three quarters. Ah, okay. Yeah, could be. I, I would have to look it up, then I mix this up. Okay, then, but we're using what the standard con uh, uh, corner cutting does. Yeah, sorry, okay. Then thanks for the correction. Okay, so it's what, what do you say? One fourth and uh, one, one three quarter and three quarters. So if okay. it's already a regular curve, it yeah. remains regular. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, then I mix this up. Thanks for the correction. Okay, so how much time do I have? It's uh, basically still including questions. So I should rather stop. Stop here. Okay, so then then let me skip this uh, uh, last part and uh, conclude. So we discussed about uh, deformation energies, and we discussed about reduction techniques for linear problems, linear dynamics. So we looked at vibration modes and uh, space-time constraints in this case of linear dynamics, and then we looked at nonlinear problems, and we looked at uh, model reduction techniques for this case at the example of nonlinear shape interpolation and then curves in shape space. So I'm happy to take uh, questions. Especially for the 
for the physically motivated interpolation of shapes as actually a very practical need, which is you have data sets online which are at the fixed frame rate, you want to do evaluations of physics, for example, at higher um, frame rates for simulation and you can't compare to those. So is your actually your work available uh, in some either standard packages, uh, code online, libraries? Uh, so for this, for this, no, the code for this is not online. So uh, in this case, uh, the implementation was done by, by, by my students and it involves sort of a system and, 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 and different libraries. So it's, it's kind of tedious to, to, to get this running here. Um, yeah, but we're working on, on, on also publishing parts of this. And uh, so thanks for the encouragement. I have, don't have code for this online uh, at this point. Uh. I would like to observe that the audience today could not refrain from laughing at many of your examples. I think this is because we, we, can, we can relate to those animals because yeah. there is a biolo biological uh, metaphor, there is a biological analogy, and the, 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 an the analogy will be the energy minimization. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it would seem that this is what makes them compelling to, to, our, to our human eyes. Mm -hmm. and so I would I would like to, to know if, if you see any way to enhance this even further, because for now the analogy is pretty weak and already it triggers all sorts of emotions, mm -hmm. so to mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. For example, in your models, every part of the model is an actuator, mm -hmm. while that's that's this here the analogy breaks. Mm -hmm. Another way that it breaks is that in your model, uh, every 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 element is uh, uh, capable of willingly contract or expand because your stress factor is uh, symmetric in that sense. Yeah. And this again is a breakage of the analogy. So is there any work that has been done uh, in this direction to try to strengthen the, the, the biological analogies? Yeah. For yeah. example, by considering <coughs> that not everything is an actuator and by considering that yeah. contracting yeah, yeah. is... So there's, uh, there's a large body of literature on articulated shapes uh, where, where basically you're controlling a skeleton, but then and then, yeah, yeah, and also it's a different type of of shapes, right? Here we have deformable shape that that would allow any uh, deformation, and the skeleton has also much lower number of degrees of freedom. But there's work in this direction for articulated shapes, right, where the biological way of actuating shapes is, is taken into consideration and this type of space-time constraints are solved. Right? This, of course, takes much more time. Uh, uh, and uh, so, but here for the deformable <coughs> this is not, not there yet, right? So here we're simplifying this quite a bit in order to be able uh, to compute this type of mode for this large deformations and so on. So these, uh, this, uh, these are quite difficult problems and there are many challenges in, in going exactly in, in, in this, these directions. Yeah? But uh, the problems get much more complicated when you don't have this nice linear structure with the vibration modes and so on. Yeah, yeah, so th th there are also sort of nonlinear materials that are, that are minimized. There's some work by, by Jeremy Barbage. Uh, but you can see that then sort of the deformations are much smaller and, and uh, the, the energy is just terribly non-convex and difficult to minimize. So then you really have to take care that you, you get uh, further with your motion, yeah, from away from your initial motion and don't just jump into the closest local minimum. So these optimization problems are quite challenging. And, and uh, yeah, but they currently there's still, uh, this type of, of, of work is still not there. Uh, yeah, thanks for the, for the, for the terrorist talk. So uh, I have a non-technical question. So I'm wondering, so to what degree are these techniques used in modern movie productions? I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. Oh, so, so I'm wondering, so, so, so to, to what degree yeah, no. are these techniques used in like modern movie productions, like, like uh, the movies we see in movie theaters? 
Yeah. So these the the space time constraints mm -hmm. well, uh, comes from from uh, an eighty eight paper by uh, uh, Witkin and Kass. Yeah, both of them worked uh, at Pixar Research for mm -hmm. for for a long time afterwards and try to improve uh, uh, these methods uh, to to actually be usable uh, mm -hmm. for animation. And uh, I'm not hundred percent sure at, at what point uh, we are there yet. Uh, so wiggly splines are uh, uh, there are examples where you can use them by just sort of painting wiggly splines, but these space-time constraints are still quite a difficult uh, uh, problem uh, in order to use them for for movie production. So I don't have any example of of, of where I know that it is used, but on the other hand, also uh, uh, it's not uh, always disclosed what techniques are used uh, by by the movie studios. For this. When you compute shape interpolation, can do you also compute self intersections or pr prevent them? No, no. In this case, this is uh, completely ignored. The any any type of self intersection is is ignored. Also, so here we want to find an average shape for for a given value and should be independent of the path, mm -hmm. right? Of how you change the, the coordinates and and then if 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 we would handle self intersection, would have to completely change this approach and then it's past dependent right mm -hmm. uh, it depends on where you come from if you want to resolve self intersection so this is this uh, uh, in this sense uh, here this is not used for the for the uh, shape interpolation for this type of model right so you so with your hands or the f with the fingers moving around or they could just uh, they, they could just intersect in this case right so in a lot of cases where these uh, uh, shape interpolation Techniques are used. For example, there's this example-based uh, materials, so where you try to control uh, material behavior by providing example shapes. Then you couple the interpolation with a physical simulation, mm -hmm. and the uh, that would always there would always be additional forces in the physical simulation trying to push the configuration towards uh, the closest interpolating shape of some examples. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that case, the physical simulation would run with uh, uh, with intersections and self intersections and so on but the shape interpolation so that's more modeling the inner forces would not not uh, need to resolve uh, any but this is uh, of course also a, a problem uh, where where in real time this is difficult to 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 achieve and and where there's work ongoing in this direction to resolve uh, collisions and 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 in particular self collisions for real time simulation of elastic uh, objects uh, hi again, thank you for your talk. Uh, so I have several questions, so maybe you can talk after that. But uh, is it possible to design, to design, um, and is it easy to design uh, specially varying material properties with this approach? Uh, so for um, the alpha and beta for the uh, energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this uh, this goes down to sort of the material response to a deformation. And let me go to one slide. And then, yeah, is that on, the case, there are no me limits me to uh, how abrupt you can change materials? So here, so this is a homogeneous model, and now mm. you could go and, and vary the material parameter. Yeah? So over the mesh, you could give different material parameters. Yeah, and this, this, this you can do of course if, if you and have it never breaks even if you have very quickly uh, <coughs> changing uh, oh, this, uh, so it's not for example a composite material mm. where you have some material that's glued on top of some other materials and then material boundaries would be quite abrupt this is this is not uncommon and it would not uh yeah would not destroy the system you can solve such such configurations yeah okay and uh, for the interpolation, is it possible to have negative weights for having cubic spline, for example, or is there something that prevents um, you from doing yeah, that? So this this model that we looked at would mm. not allow you negative weights. So because it's a sum over uh, the different energies, and once mm. you have a negative weight, uh, uh, one of them would be uh, uh, could go to negative infinity. So they are all bounded below by zero, right? So so then you have a problem that is bounded. 
below, but if you have one negative weight, then it could go to infinity and there will always be some direction in which, in which that one would dominate and you can go to infinity. So then the Im problem immediately is not well posed anymore. In practice, you can find some negative, yeah, you can find solutions for some negative values, but, but at some point it would break. Uh, so that's a limitation of this approach. If you want to go further, then you can use geodesics in shape space right, and use sort of the exponential map, so continue a geodesic further out and, and, and then you can uh, also extrapolate. Uh, so there's work in this direction where you can do shape interpolation. Even more advanced in the metrics that you get from shape space. And then you can compute something like uh, a center of mass, Riemannian center of mass or Karcher mean in uh, with respect to the metric of the shape space. Right? But this, this is then also more involved. Uh, computation, but then you have a model that, that, that can extend outwards. I think there's even a, a paper in the conference uh, talking about exactly this. Thanks uh, for a nice talk. I, um, there was one thing I didn't catch, Klaus. The, uh, the curves in shape space, uh, I assume that they lie, or the, the valid shapes on a sub-manifold, uh, but it could perhaps be expensive to project back onto that when you've taken the averages. So if you could briefly explain how that works. Yeah. Possibly I just didn't catch it. Hold on. So it's sort of... Uh <laughs> So here in this, e so this is, I, I guess, the example. So we're, so the point is we're uh, constructing a linear space such that it would approximate uh, this manifold of interpolated shapes, right? And we're not uh, optimizing in, in the set of all configurations, but we're just trying in this, in this low dimensional space to get the closest uh, uh, shape. So, yeah, and then there are there are uh, 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 different ways of how you can 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 optimize. And if you now would optimize in in the space of all configurations, and you know you would say change a little bit one one of the parameters only, then you could sort of uh, do try to get compute some projections. But but I I guess in practice this is very difficult to to uh, uh, get these projections accurate enough to to take advantage of this. So what we're here doing is really. Uh, Nonlinear optimization in in this reduced space where we're minimizing uh, uh, this energy, but we're not uh, trying to 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 sort of be stay on the manifold. So we're really computing new uh, optimization problems for every uh, set of weights. If you change the weights, we'll compute it completely new. No, we're not starting with a solution and then trying to stay on the manifold by by some sort of projection. It's computed new. We may take the, the, the old one as a starting point in, in this interactive tool where, 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 where you get this, but, but that's, that's all. In, in principle, we're computing it from scratch. We're not using previous uh, uh, minimizers here. But, but later you, you compute these uh, averages of, of points in shape space to sort of smooth the curves. Yeah. So, so I guess... Yeah, so in, 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 in that case, we also set up one linear space uh, out of looking at the curve and then observing the shapes that are in the curve, we're constructing one linear space to which we restrict the whole optimization here. Okay, so, so basically when I've computed the average, I have a shape in that shape space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. So then we're, yeah, then the optimization. So you could think about updating uh, this reduced space after some, some uh, if you really smooth the curve, then, then it deviates from the initial shapes and then you could uh, think about updating or, or augmenting this uh, reduced space, but, but we didn't do this uh, for these examples. But that would be, of course, also possible. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, okay. So you mentioned, yeah, you mentioned uh, thin shells briefly. Mm -hmm. So is it possible to compute vibration modes just on the surface? And if yes, how does it compare with the volumetric results? Yeah, so uh, yeah, you, you can compute the vibration modes exactly in the same, same way if you have a shell. Right? So you have an energy for the shell that includes then a bending term. Then you calculate the Hessian and you calculate the modes of this. And this will give you vibrations of the shell. Would it give similar results to what you have for TED meshes? Or 
Uh, so you can compare this to doing a, uh, a TET mesh along the surface, right? And then computing the, the, the modes of this, and that, that I, I didn't do this explicitly, but that should be resulting in the similar uh, uh, resu uh, uh, similar results. So these shells are constructed basically by thinking, uh, uh, yeah, by by having a, uh, a a structure that adapts. Yeah, so you have, have a shell, and then you assume that the middle surface is a surface, and then that it's thin around the surface of of same density, and then depending on the model for thin shells you use, right, uh, uh, you have some additional uh, assumptions on how this changes, and then you can play this back to an optimization of, uh, of the, yeah, that involves stretching and bending terms for the surface only. Uh, so in that can, can sense, the thin gels are approximations of a volumetric model of the same shell. And if it's well modeled, uh, then you get the same modes.